So welcome everybody to the expanding your CRM to your entire business. Specifically how to do it for your, the publishing industry, but at the same time be rolled out for even your daily life if you really want to. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce myself and people to my left will also be introduced. My name is Kevin Horowitz. I'm the business and sales operations manager for NEJM group. Basically what that means for here today, I'm the sales force administrator and developer uh, for NEJM. Also, I have about 20 years experience in sales in general, including about 10, 15 years in publishing, but I've sold everything from fine cutlery to flags and banners, textbooks, what have you. Got a, I have a huge interest in operations and within, with data, just love the numbers. I remember back in the day, back in my flag and banner day, looking at the fact that we had one person who was responsible for putting together all these quotes for us. And she would really base her quotes, really not in reality, honestly. She didn't have anything beyond, uh, behind what, why she was quoting certain ways. And it really bothered me as a sales rep. So I remember going to her and basically saying, hey, Kay, hey, can you quote this in just a banner that had five letters on it? And she gave me a price of $200. And then the next day I came to her with the same exact requests, except the letters were just rearranged a little bit. Luckily, she didn't catch on. And she quoted, instead of $200, she quoted $400. And the next day, did the same thing. She quoted $300. And I went to management. I said, OK, we still need to get, she's fine, resp yeah, she's responsible for quotes. But at the same time, it would be great if there's transparency into why the numbers were what they were. And that's something that a CRM can actually help you with. So I'm going to turn this over to the people to my left. I actually met. Beth and Kathy at last year's SSP. So it just goes to show you that networking is not just an excuse to put for drinking, for putting on your TNA, you're where, you're where you can put, oh my God, I screwed up this joke. Yes. I've been asking this all day, you know? All this pressure. So it's not just, a, we're not just where you're going to put the line item for net. You know what? I'm going to go on. Yes. Uh, you know, that sounded so good in my head. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Yeah. All right, so I, I can go ahead and, and make a quick introduction. So my name is Kathy Holland. I'm a business development manager on the publishing team at Digital Science. And prior to that, I worked with a AAAS in science for about 12 years, kind of in their you know, site licensing sales operation. And you know, I think it was at that point where you know, holding several different roles, you know, my most recent there being a sales manager where I became more interested in Salesforce and the data behind things and how to get where you know our team wanted to be and I think this this only carries through to kind of my my newer role in digital science because they they deal with a lot of data day to day and, and that's kind of what Salesforce is um, and so that's just kind of my my background so and Beth and I'm Beth Hoskins. Um, I'm the sales development manager at Ringgold. Um, and I, my role at Ringgold is that I help clients implement Ringgold's data, both in CRM systems and other enterprise systems in the industry. Um, I've been in the industry for about 16 years. And I, my background is mostly in publishing. And even though I've been mostly in sales analysis and consortium sales, I've kind of earned myself a side job as a CRM administrator over the years. So um, I have been the administrator for both Microsoft Dynamics and Salesforce systems um, at three different companies. It's a side job, but it's a perk. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it absolutely is a perk. <laughs> okay. So just to go over the agenda today, so we're going to go, it's going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about just ideas for expanding your CRM. It's kind of like expanding your consciousness. And just talk about, we're going to talk about in the context of the sales process to start because that's what you're used to. You're used to the CRM as either a big address book or, or working with your sales process. But you can use that to actually start bringing in things and farming out things to other departments. Sometimes and it's a lot easier than you may even think. So talking about also using your CRM to provide data to external partners, talking about when you have a CRM, you have to pay for your seats, pay for your licenses. You don't, maybe you have a sales partner that you want to provide Salesforce data to. You don't want to have to pay for a, a, a seat for them. There are other ways you can actually provide the data to them in actually a way that's actually professional looking, it's pr perhaps on a website, something like that. Not something where you can have to export it necessarily to an Excel spreadsheet, manipulate that, and then send it over to them. We're going to show you some tips and tricks about how to do that. 
and then we'll have a Q&A session in case you're really curious to pick our brains. We're all Excel and data nerds up here, so if you ever have Excel mysteries, Salesforce mysteries, Dynamics mysteries, we're all for that, so. <laughs> All right, so just to lay some groundwork in case anyone is new to CRMs or doesn't work with in one currently, um, what is a CRM? Uh, a CRM is a customer relationship management application. Um, so a lot of you might be familiar with Salesforce, Microsoft Dyna Dynamics, NetSuite. Um, there are many, many others out there, both uh, large scale and small. They're typically cloud-based, although not all the time. Um, and they are licensed by the number of seats or users. Um, typically, well, not typically, often this is just the sales team of an organization, um, which is you know, part of the reason we're here today is to kind of talk about how it doesn't have to be limited to that. Um, it, CRMs are known as technology that really kind of track the lead to sales process and stop there. Um, again, they don't have to stop there. Um, and they are very, very flexible systems. Um, they're very easy to customize both for your entire site and then also at the user level. So why would you consider expanding your CRM beyond sales? Um, so most of us have a CRM system um, that we work with in the companies that we work for. Um, again, they're often utilized only by the sales department. Um, the kind of unique thing about CRMs is that they can be customized by people who are not programmers or developers. Um, I'm a good example of that. I've really been in, you know, done a lot in Excel and so forth, but I have become a CRM administrator over the years and really done a lot with it considering I'm not trained as a developer. Um, CRMs offer many ways to interact with users outside of the system, so not having seats um, you know, in, say, your editorial production departments should not be a deterrent to not expand it more um, because these technologies actually are really good at facilitating working with users that actually aren't in the system. And uh, lastly, CRMs are one of the most flexible systems that you probably have at your company. Um, you would be surprised by the efficiencies that you can find um, using your CRM, even through very simple changes. Hmm. All right, so now what we're kind of gonna do is, you know, when we were thinking about this, you know, we were thinking about how kind of everything else fits in almost kind of around the sales process since where it, that's where it starts. And so what we thought we would do is, you know, kind of for me, I'm on kind of the business development side of things. And I was gonna kind of go through a typical what I call sales track. And I definitely equate it to a train system because you can go full circle, you can have kind of connections here and there. Um, and it really is very synonymous with that. And so kind of as we take you through this process, you know, I'm, we're going to talk about various ways that the CRM can be expanded in each aspect within this process. And so, you know, kind of the, the first place everything starts is, you know, with your, your leads and your prospects. And to kind of break that down a little further, there's kind of what I look at, you know, three components here. You've got your kind of incoming sales leads from you know, primarily marketing, but also other you know, places because leads come in all forms. Um, you know, a good example of kind of another outside place is you know, back in the day when I was at Science, every once in a while I would get somebody from editorial, hey, this customer wants X, Y, and Z, and I'd be like, okay. So you know, that's a nice way to show how things can come from other areas. Then there's also kind of your sales identified prospects where your sales team is looking at kind of the customer base and saying, okay, I know based on my experience, if Harvard is a customer, Yale should probably be a customer too. So they're a solid prospect. And then of course, there's the kind of lead qualification aspect to it is, you know, as a team, you know, how do you want to qualify these and at what point do you want to hand things off? And at this point, I am definitely not going to get into sales and marketing alignment, but if you have not thought about it, I would encourage you to at some point Google that. And you know, so kind of when looking at all of these different components in the start of the sales process, you know, really kind of the question or problem that comes to my mind is, is the handoff, you know, how and when are these leads handed off to sales? If, if they come from other areas besides marketing, like editorial or maybe your communications offices, maybe somebody coming from a trade show, how do we ensure that they don't get lost in that kind of black hole of the email box? So. 
So um, CRMs are really great systems for solving this kind of problem where you have a lot of data coming from different departments that kind of need to land with sales. Um, so a few ways that you could facilitate this um, would be to use connectors with other programs. So um, email marketing automation programs are a great example of technology that typically connect with um, some of the bigger CRMs. Um, often that connection is just part of your license and you don't have to do anything extra. So you can connect those systems um, so that they're talking to each other in a live way. Um, the Bigger CRM systems also have app stores um, where you can actually go and download apps that other developers have created um, and often are endorsed by companies like Salesforce. Um, and so there are a lot of apps in those stores that are either cheap or no cost um, that can you know, facilitate other ways to bring in leads into your CRM from other departments. Um, an example of that would be business card scanners. So if your exhibits people are at a conference, um, you could use this app you know, to your CRM to kind of send that for, so that they're just taking pictures with their phone and it's going straight into the CRM. Um, another thing that you can do is actually build external web forms um, to interact with users uh, throughout your company that don't have seats or licenses to your CRM. Um, Kevin's going to show an example of um, what that looks like in a minute. Um, so that's something that CRMs all mostly facilitate um, where you, know, you can just actually link it to fields and take in information that goes straight into your CRM. And um, lastly, just an easy option is that you can always just upload CSV or Excel files to your CRM. Um, if you have ongoing needs that are, uh, you know, where you're getting the same file format repeatedly, um, you can often make data maps that you've saved so that that's automated on some level, um, or you can also template the uploads. And actually, speaking about the, the apps, there's actually some really great free apps available for Salesforce, I'm sure, for Dynamics as well, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. So this is just an example of a web form. This is actually from NEJM's website. Actually, if you're an institution, you can actually go to our main website, say, I'm an institution, I'd like to get a quote. This will direct you to a, a third party, a third party vendor that we have uh, that basically provides a site for us to put a form in. The customer would fill out all this relevant information, you know, who they are and what they're looking for and, and, and yada, 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 who they are like in terms of hospital or uh, if they're in a university. That information then, as soon as it gets submitted, it will populate Salesforce as a lead. It'll populate it as, okay, this, is coming, this person is coming from this institution, all the relevant information. And then based on the criteria that the, your administrator set up, it'll route this lead to the appropriate sales rep. So, so if you say, okay, everything from Brazil is gonna go to this one sales rep, unless it's a hospital, or unless it's a, uh, it's, it has over 400 beds or something like that, just route it appropriately. And on top of that, you can set up triggers that alert the sales reps or automatically create certain tasks or th certain things within your CRM so that if certain actions need to be taken by certain people, they can be alerted to that. Okay, now as we kind of continue along our, our sales track, you know, you enter into the point where you're, you're having initial discussions with your, your new customer or product, uh, you know, and as you start to talk with them, you know, you're going to encounter a huge amount of data and information. And there's also going to be data and information that you're going to need as sales, or there's data and information that is going to be maybe relevant to some other departments. And if I kind of break this down into, you know, kind of two, I guess, data groups. Um, there's kind of examples of data that sales might need, and this is going to consist of things like, you know, usage or maybe turnaway reports if you're, you know, selling a journal. Um, maybe you need to know if someone at the organization you're talking with is on an editorial board or well connected within, you know, your own group internally. You know, also kind of customer service and marketing touches. You know, has the has this potential customer been pinged 40 times by marketing, and you know you're going in, and they're going to be like, "What the heck are you doing? You guys are driving me nuts." Um, or, or maybe it's something much more positive than that, where you know that they've gone to maybe your last three webinars on a very specific product, um, and so that's kind of the this data that you know I might need in kind of my business development role, and then. Examples of kind of data that other groups need. 
Um, maybe you have a contact that's a subject specialist in an area and you're thinking to yourself, you know, this would be great for so-and-so at this program or in this department to know about. So you want to be able to send that off to them. You know, in other organizations, the person that sets up a trial or does a demonstration may not be the same person kind of at the forefront liaising. So you need ways to kind of hand off and let those groups know that they can take things forward. And as we move forward in technology, you're also going to have, you know, maybe development needs or technical needs. So you're going to have to start integrating technical teams. You know, further on down the road, your press office might want to have some information. If you have a really, you know, prominent, you know, prospect on the table, that's going to be great information for them. Or maybe marketing wants to do a case study. And, you know, when I kind of think about, you know, the, the problem or the question that comes into this segment, it's, I think, Sales does not always have easy visibility into these things, and other departments don't always have easy visibility into these things. And it can really take time to source it out. And so how can a CRM kind of help give visibility to some of these data you know, components? I know in my, my textbook sales days, I know that editors would love it when I referred contacts who could be, be potential authors. So people I was trying to sell textbooks to, they, whether they said yes or no, a lot of times they were a subject matter expert and they said, gave me feedback about a certain textbook and suddenly there's a new concept for a textbook that the editor can try to acquire. So um, CRMs are really well set up to automate the transfer of information um, between you know, users in the system and outside. Um, and they also have a lot of storage capability, um, whether that is actually storing documents and information in the CRM for people to use or actually connecting to other programs. Um, so a few ways that you can do this um, is you can actually set up CRM processes um, to facilitate handoffs to other departments. Um, that would be either, you know, email notifying or if or you could also do reporting for that kind of transfer of information. Um, in the case of, you know, trials and uh, also looking at, I guess, historical information when you're having an initial conversation with a new prospect and, you know, in this industry often we have worked with that same institution before. Um, connecting system data into your CRM, whether that's, you know, an automated connection that you use the data connector for or uploads, um, can provide a lot of visibility into uh, not only the previous order history, but also the trial. So um, I know that in my sales life, a big part of this initial conversation stage is usually demos and trials and things like that. Um, so you could also bring in your usage data, um, and CRMs can even be set up to monitor you know, the usage for you um, so that, you know, as a sales rep, instead of going to your customer service department repeatedly and asking them about this, um, you know for sure that it's set up um, and you also are, you know, getting notified if it's not being used or if it's being heavily used and, you know, maybe that's a really great indicator and you want to kind of up the ante on that conversation. Um, so CRMs also are a good place to store documents. Um, you can store documents, you know, actually in your CRM, um, but I think, you know, kind of a more desirable way to do it is that most big CRMs actually connect with SharePoint, Dropbox. Um, so when you're using those technologies, if people replace the files, it would just, you know, have the same path so you wouldn't have to update it in your CRM. Um, so usually that those connections are facilitated through connectors or apps that you would get on the App Store. Um, I, right now, administer Microsoft Dynamics, um, so because it's a Microsoft product, it automatically connects to all other Microsoft programs. Um, so you could also, you know, for instance, set up just a library of materials and information about products, and you could be, you know, sourcing that information from your editors or your product development team and using your CRM to store that so that everyone has access to it. So no, we actually, at NEJM, we capture the cost per download based on the usage information we get from our usage provider. We get that usage in, we compare it to, our, to how much uh, the customer is paying, and we have that readily available at any time that the sales rep wants to check in and see if there's any kind of anomalies they need to be alerted to, or when they're actually talking about renewal pricing. All right, so now as we kind of continue along our, our train line and sales track here, we're coming to what I like to consider the more fun stage is, is the negotiation process. You can tell we're salespeople. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and you know, when you kind of hit this stage, there's there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things going on. You know, you're going to have changes that are going to be need need to be made within your proposal. You might need input from senior leaders, and in some cases, other departments. You're going to need maybe approvals for pricing changes because everybody loves to negotiate on price. Um, they, maybe you have to bend other policies that you know could have some important implications. Uh, you're obviously at some point, you know, dealing with contracts, going to have to pull in the legal team to, you know, so they can do some red lines and send it back. And also technical teams to discuss kind of customer needs, maybe do a full-blown statement of work to kind of outline what's needed. You know, there's, there's a lot that can go on just in, in that one single aspect right there. And, you know, if you think about it, all of these kind of changes and approvals, and if you bend a policy here and there, they could definitely have wider, you know, implications to your organization. You know, if you keep having to bend the same policy over and over and over, it's probably time to revisit that policy. And so with, with all of these things kind of going on, you know, I think the question that in kind of my mind that we wanted to address is, how do you quickly and easily notify the right people? How can this process be really transparent and efficient? And how can, on the other end, business analysts really start to see these approvals and exceptions to see if you know policies might need to be tweaked by the whole organization? So um, CRMs are set up to do things like track approval processes, and that does not have to just be between sales reps and sales managers. Um, that could definitely be expanded within your organization um, so that you are you know, tracking an approval process, um, you know, that's a part of your sales process that goes out to other departments. Um, and not only do you have those approvals, but you have them all in one place and tracked and also reportable. Um, so you could, uh, you know, use an approval process to track this kind of internal communication um, between other stakeholders, product development, your legal team. Um, I think that most of us who've been in sales know that we make a lot of uh, exceptions during this phase that often don't come to fruition for sometimes a year or more. Um, so it's really important that we have that documented somewhere and we also know who approved it. Um, so CRMs are really good for keeping all of that information together. Um, CRMs also support building templates that work off of CRM data. So this would be an efficiency that you could find in this process um, as you're tracking these different exceptions that you're making. Um, if they say affect the contract or the site license agreement, you can actually have fields for that um, so that you know, you're collecting it as a part of this process, but then later um, you can actually you know, run a template PDF, which Kevin's actually going to show an example in a second, that will actually pull that field in so that you're not actually you know, hand keying that into your contract. Um, so in addition to you know, communicating with your legal department and having a record of that using the CRM, um, you also have found the efficiency of um, you know, that you know, just kind of tedious contract work in Microsoft Word. Um, and just to mention, I know that, you know, every CRM is different. Um, Salesforce requires HTML to set up templates. It's pretty, you know, kind of low key. Uh, Microsoft Dynamics is an example of a system where um, you can actually use just standard Word documents to make templates. Um, and even users can do that at the user level. So um, you don't even have to have your administrator involved in that necessarily. Um, and then, as Kathy was mentioning, you know, this is also a point where you're getting that feedback about your pricing models and, you know, different, I guess, key information about your terms. And I know that, you know, at the end of the year or two years later, if something has come up repeatedly, it's often hard to quantify that. Um, a CRM is a good way to actually be able to report on these kind of exceptions. Um, you could consider adding pick list fields, um, so structuring the data so that you can see that um, you, know, you made a bunch of exceptions around the price. So you continued to discount it in order to get sales. So maybe you need to revisit the pricing model or consider it when you're developing your next product's um, pricing model. Um, and then lastly, um, you actually can kind of 
take this to like full circle um, in terms of contracting and so forth because you know one of the apps that often can connect to CRMs I know it connects to Salesforce really easily is uh, DocuSign and you know other mm -hmm. applications like that um, so you actually could have this entire process native to your CRM and even exchange the signatures and have that all tracked in your CRM um, so that you weren't you know kind of taking it out of that system and kind of throwing it around and having emails everywhere and all of the things that um, a lot of us have dealt with dealt with in our career <laughs> so Kevin's going to show an example of the so template. Who here wants to look like a hero that actually works in, as an administrator or developer? <laughs> that should be all of you. Come on. Yes. Right. So what we're, showing, what we're going to show you here on the left side is the contract object in Salesforce. And you can see there we have the account, the Dissemination Cafe and Bookstore. And we have it set up on the right side. The publication, basically the journal, is called Burnt Toast. I hope that's not copyrighted, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, and contact name, basically who we're sending it to. It's for a site license. And we're also saying in the bottom left, OK, so Dissemination Cafe and Bookstore is the primary customer. But Yankee Bread Peddler Distribution and Innovative Pastry Distributors, great names, should actually have access along with the primary account. Now the good thing is, is that all we have to do now that we have that information, I've already loaded in the boilerplate, the stuff that really doesn't change on our contract, and had only the custom, such custom fields that we put in, so the account name and the publication type, things like that, have that populated in the contract. And on the bottom right, you're seeing just a portion of a PDF that I can generate just from this page, just by clicking a button, now it shows you who the subscriber is. This is at the bottom of our contract. Who the primary contact is, okay, and who are the subscriber sites are permitted under the agreement. And it'll populate all this data and be ready for the customer to sign. Now, can you use DocuSign for, the, for something like this? Absolutely. And I don't want to tell you to not use it, but at the same time, there is existing functionality in Salesforce. And how is it with Dynamics? Is, is there a built-in with that or? No. no. So, so with, but with Salesforce, you have that contract functionality. You may have to tweak it just to make sure it's good for your organization, but at the same time, it's very easy to actually generate a PDF from existing data, or honestly, not even just for contracts, it could be for really for anything. We do it for some of our custom invoicing occasionally. We need to generate something really quick so that maybe there's a pro forma that needs to be generated. We can take an, an opportunity, click a button, and just basically generates a PDF based on just some HTML code and a little bit of uh, some Salesforce specific code that'll generate something that looks very professional that the customer can use. Yeah, just to mention, I mean, if kind of, can any of you are in Microsoft Dynamics, um, you can actually just go into your user settings and start setting up those templates based on Word or even Excel documents. So you don't have to be an administrator at all or do anything with HTML for that in Dynamics. Beth and I fight about this a lot. <laughs> Dynamics versus Salesforce, that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so as we kind of continue down our path, you know, now we're at the point where, like a train, it kind of switches tracks. People can get on, people can get off. There's a couple of different things happening. So, you know, at the end of the road, you can go a couple different ways. You've got, you know, closed one, which is great. Everybody's happy about that. Closed lost, which I have a nice little sad face for because everybody's sad about that. Or there's kind of other post-sales needs. Um, and so when I kind of bucket that, I, I look at kind of with closed one, you're going to have handoffs to multiple departments. You're, you know, some, to send something to finance for invoicing, you know, maybe engagement people need to be alerted for kind of proper training and engagement of the, the new customer. You know, communications needs to hear about this, you know, for, you know, press announcements, exciting things like that. Maybe there's implementation that needs to be done. You know, maybe technical teams need to be alerted to get things done. And that's all just within kind of the closed one sphere. And then if you look at the closed lost sphere, this also has some kind of interesting implications. Um, because there, there's definitely times where if you're maybe a membership organization, somebody you're talking with, you know, it really, it doesn't make sense for maybe a journal, but maybe they need to be an individual member. So you can actually kind of shunt that off over to membership. Or maybe the client has an interest in something else completely different, like advertising. Um, or the other, you know, kind of third thing that comes to mind immediately is that full circle thing where they go kind of back into a marketing queue for further nurturing where they've got kind of interest but they're definitely not primed to purchase anything yet 
And then I also have that kind of last bucket of other post-sales needs, because I think every organization is really unique, and they might have something that I have not necessarily accounted for that they need to do. And one kind of question, or, well, maybe not question, but I'm going to say this is the audience participation question. Um, is we were kind of wondering, you know, how many people have clear written documentation in terms of what your kind of sales team should do post-close, and you kind of acti actively train teams on what to do, and maybe even have a service level agreement with people? Show of hands that you have a post-sales process that's documented? Raise them high so we can see them. Yeah, how about, how about people that actually have a closed lost yeah. strategy, what to do with that? All right. Okay, okay, but you know, definitely something to consider is you know what happens after the close process. I will tell you, as a salesperson, if that is clearly documented, it makes life so much easier. So, just my two cents there. And so, you you really need a lot of alignment between kind of marketing, sales, and operations. And I think one thing I have learned over the years is not one one of those groups is not more correct than the other. And you really need kind of solid collaboration across all those groups to get things done. But you know, kind of back to that original question or, or problem is looking at all these kind of post sales needs and handoffs. You know, what is the best and most transparent way to handle these functions? So I mean, obviously, um, you know, when you lose a sale, um, there's a very different process involved than when you take on a new customer. So I'm going to kind of talk about what CRM can do to help in both ways. Um, so. Closed is lost. Um, you know, the CRM really can help communicate with other people around your organization about why products don't get sold um, and really automate this post sales process. Um, so, as Kathy mentioned, if you know, maybe you are sending, you know, if, if you lose an opportunity and you're sending it back to marketing or another department, um, this is something that you could automate as a part of your CRM processes. Um, CRMs also collect lost reasons out of the box. Typically, this is a free text field. Um, so this can be uh, shared with uh, other users at your company via automated emails or um, automated reports. Um, and that really could you know, give other departments a chance to step in and say, you know, I saw that you lost this opportunity for this reason. Uh, that's not true, or we're willing to make a policy change. And you know, perhaps that could uh, kind of reopen that possibility for you. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the negotiation phase, um, you can also, you know, in addition to that lost reason that is kind of standard in CRMs that is a free text field, you could consider structuring this data um, to support product development, business development, um, and, you know, just modeling moving forward. Um, so, for instance, if you had a pick list of reasons why opportunities were lost, uh, maybe, you know, price and license options were two of your reasons, um, you know, you could start to collecting that on a bigger scale so that your organization can actually revisit that um, as you're developing you know, new models or just you know, trying to figure out why haven't we sold this product as much as we had anticipated. Um, so this is a really good way to just quantify that feedback on a bigger level. So um, the one opportunity, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, when you close this one, it's a really different process where I think a lot of departments get involved. Um, typically, sales is not the one who enters the order, does the invoice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yet, sales still really cares about this process, obviously, because you're the one who did, you know, a lot of work um, to get this sale to come to fruition. Um, so because there's so many handoffs in the process, um, CRMs are a great way to kind of implement an onboard process um, so you could do that in a number of ways um, which would instigate you know the cross department responsibilities of you know when an opportunity is won um, so you could start you know email notifications or um, you know different ways of notifying other departments that this opportunity has been won so here's the price and you know we're ready for you to set up the order um, CRM processes support schedulers and wait times. Um, so, you know, one of the benefits of setting up a onboarding process is that you don't have to just deal with what's happening immediately. Um, you could also incorporate things like a check-in six months later, or um, you know, making sure that the usage is calculating three months later. Um, so, there's a lot of ways to use your CRM to find efficiencies um, across departments. Um, you know, typically that would be between sales and operations. Um, I, in my past, that's something where there's been a lot of 
emails exchanged and just a lot of checking um, and a lot of time in both departments, just making sure that customers are onboarded properly. Um, we had already mentioned templates um, because CRMs can, you know, make uh, templates that kind of reformat information in different ways. Um, if you have, say, a technical team that requires a certain format, um, that would be a way to, you know, not have to go and re-enter it into their system, and, or you could, you could actually send it to them in the format that they prefer. Um, and you could also use those templates to notify customers. Um, so you could, you know, automate emails thanking them or, um, you know, reminding them to, I don't know, you know, do something like set up their IPs, so things like that. Um, so that's, you know, again, something that sometimes will happen in an operations system. You could use your CRM for that instead if you wanted a little bit more control. Um, and Kevin's going to talk about this more later, um, but data connectors, um, data connectors are technology that kind of serve to translate information between systems. Um, if you do decide to invest in a data connector, um, and some examples are Del Boomi and Scribe, um, this is a way to you know bring that data into your CRM maybe from your fulfillment system but it also could allow you to instigate an order at this stage in the process um, so that there as a there is not a person in operations hand keying this order anymore um, and uh, you know similarly you could receive the information back um, you know ideally you'd also have usage going in so it just kind of connects the whole process and brings it all together so that you can really nurture that customer um, in the beginning and you know, you don't have to stop there. You could actually instigate processes that continue nurturing that customer over time. All right, I think this is actually a, you know, a couple of Beth's comments are a good segue into this, what I consider kind of the final component in the sales track, and it's renewal, which is kind of your full circle, and also continued engagement, which, which Beth had talked about. And, you know, I think, there's definitely a lot of links and kind of connections here, and this is definitely moving away from sales. Um, in, in some cases, I'll say, away from sales. Because you have to, at first, you know, within an organization decide, you know, who is responsible for kind of each component of this. And it's gonna be different for different organizations, as every organization is gonna have different needs and needs to think about, you know, who handles the renewal, who's handling the engagement, and who is getting product feedback. And at least for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to think about as sales as handling kind of the, the renewal process. Um, and I, I think, you know, when you handle a renewal, you really, you want the customer to renew, of course. And in order to make sure that's happening, you, you need a few kind of pieces of information. You have to make sure, for one, they're actually using what you've got. You need to make sure there's not something crazy going on behind the scenes you know, them contacting customer service 40 times because they don't have access or something's not working or, or maybe there's, a, you know, a major product feature missing. You know, engagement definitely becomes a big part of this. You know, I know some organizations have, you know, entire people dedicated to kind of sales engagement, which is really important. You don't just want to hit the customer up at the end of the year and be like, oh, hey, time to renew, please give me money. You want to actually be working with them throughout the year. And that, that's going to be really important is making sure, you know, in terms of sales that that's actually happening. And then the third kind of thing that I really like to think about is constant customer feedback and product development. I know that that's something, you know, at Digital Science they do very well is they ingest that feedback and they use it to make their tools better and more suited to the market. And so you have to kind of think about that for longer term growth and who's responsible for that and how you're going to collect that feedback and how is it shared between the departments that would need to know about it. And so when I think about this in terms of kind of our, you know, kind of our current flow with kind of the question or, you know, challenge at the end is, you know, how is sales going to know how many other touches the customer has had and from what departments? Um, what other departments might need to know kind of the same information or information in terms of what sales is doing or how many times sales is reaching out because you don't want to have too much overlap um, maybe between engagement and sales. That's not fun for anybody to get too many emails. And, you know, how can this feedback really be effectively passed on so things can get better for your kind of end user group? So I, I talked a lot about this in the last phase, um, but you know, the CRMs can really help you to aggregate this information so that you're kind of looking at a customer 360, um, you know, especially post-sale, so that you know, often we kind of 
don't spend as much time on retention. Um, CRMs definitely provide a way to kind of automate that and find efficiencies in that process. Um, so in the renewal and engagement process um, or stage of a sale, um, connections between systems are obviously really helpful here. Um, so if you are able to start bringing in information from, say, your operations system, um, you know, this would be, they would really lead to a lot more that you could do in your CRM. And of course, that does not stop with your operation system. Um, it could also be uh, technical support, ticketing systems, service tickets. Um, one of the things about using a data connector is that you're not as limited in terms of what connects to CRMs. Um, but you can also do uploads. Like I feel like we haven't talked as much about that, but you can always just upload information. So it does not have to be as complex as being automated. You could just make it very easy to upload it regularly. Um, even though CRMs are typically used for the lead to sales process, um, most CRMs actually have a post sale, they have post sales tables like orders and invoices, um, which are often not utilized in a lot of companies. But this actually gives those containers that you can do kind of light customization to, to hold information from other systems um, or to upload it into so that you don't have to like build them from scratch, which is helpful. I know that Salesforce and Dynamics definitely have a you know major post sales component, even a service ticketing uh, module that you could you know bring your I don't know email ticketing system tickets into um, so that you could really see you know everything that's happening around that customer. Um, and you really could use your CRM to automate your renewals process if you are aggregating this information together. I know that sales often gets involved at renewal again, um, whether that is to verify the price or to actually give the price to operations. Uh, a CRM would be a really good way to make that communication happen and have that tracked um, and kind of more automated you know, using this technology. Um, and as I mentioned in the last stage, um, you could also check in with customers um, and, you know, generate the actual emails uh, using your CRM. Um, I know enterprise systems, you know, often have a renewals module. Um, CRMs are a lot more flexible. Um, I'm not saying that you can't use your enterprise systems, uh, you know, renewals module, but I know that in my past when I've done, you know, for instance, consortium sales, um, we definitely did not use that because the invoices were not customized enough um, and weren't kind of rendering in the way that we wanted to show our, you know, very high dollar customers. Um, and, you know, kind of to go full circle back to um, what I talked about in leads, you know, in the lead generation uh, process, um, you know, once you have a customer, you often are getting really valuable feedback about your product from them. Um, so, you know, you can keep collecting that feedback, um, whether that's coming into sales or operations, um, by having it all in your CRM, um, you know, you could consider structuring that data. And again, it's just, you know, another way to really uh, be better informed on your products, you know, why they're selling or not selling, um, and any issues that you have with your sales or pricing policies. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the renewal automation process. So I'm sure as we're all academic publishing in some way, shape, or form, how many of you guys deal with renewal hell seasons? <laughs> you know, usually, yeah, oh yeah, usually end of the year, that kind of thing. So we're going to show you just some suggestions about potential ways you can automate the process. So we start, with, start at the top of the list. The rep can be alerted of an upcoming expiration. So three mo four months before, something's going to expire. Maybe you want the rep to be alerted. Something's coming up. I need you to review pricing. They're going to go ahead and review it. Salesforce, though, will automate, or any CRM can automate the process of alerting the rep, saying it's coming up due. You have to do this within a certain amount of days. Once they actually take care, once they go in to Salesforce, they'll review the accounts, maybe they review the, the uses, the cost per download. They'll submit their pricing. Their manager that can then get alerted automatically through, through your CRM, saying, this is the price they suggested. This is the reason why this price change is above or below a certain percentage. And can you approve this or not? And if they reject it, it can be kicked back to the review stage again. Or if they approve it, then it goes into a queue to actually get renewal notices deployed. And those renewal notices can be populated with personalized information from your CRM. That includes not just the institution name and the contact name, but also can include pricing, their tier, their new expiration dates, uh, and You'll, you can set it up to go out at regular intervals. So I know it's NEJM at about three months before expire, we'll send out a first notice saying, hey, something uh, is coming up to be expired, here's your notice. 
can you please click on this just to confirm that your goal you're planning on renewing? And then two months, it gets a little bit more urgent, then one month out, and then zero month, we're going, what the hell, guys? <laughs> but we're still sending out those notices, and it keeps going on for a few months afterwards, warning them about potential losing access, and also alerting the reps as well, okay, these people have not renewed, so can you please reach out to them? So set up alerts based on where they are in the renewal process. Then once the actual customer says, yes, I do intend to renew, for NGM, we actually have them submit it through a, a third party vendor, just a form basically, that communicates directly with our CRM. The CRM then lets the rep know, but what it also does is that it closes the opportunity as one, oh, excuse me, as commit, saying we're committing to this renewal, and then log creates a service ticket, a case for our customer service team to enter into our subscription and billing management system. And from there, an invoice will be deployed. Now, whether that invoice is deployed manually or, or through an automated process, that's why I kind of colored a little differently because you can go either or that way depending on your preference. Then once the payment comes in and the customer service takes it, enters that into their billing and management, billing and subscription management system, now we have a new ex official expired date. That data, whether you're syncing it with your CRM via an API or with a data connector or just a manual upload, we can upload that, that data into our CRM. It'll update the payment information. It'll update the, the revenue over the course of your fiscal year if you're broken, breaking out monthly. All that fun stuff that you need to do. It'll do it automatically so that your reps are spending more time selling and less time doing administrative work. And then it just comes full circle. You wait another eight months and now they're gonna start getting alerts saying, hey, coming up for renewal again. I love this slide. So, <laughs> so uh, the point being, um, even in our standard sales process that most people use the CRM for, there are a lot of other departments involved that you can use your CRM to communicate with, aggregate information, you know, together using your CRM, um, and also, you know, just track the whole process and the communication that you have with other departments. Um, we really thought that kind of going with the standard sales process um, kind of as a point of reference would be helpful just to kind of show that there are, you know, so many other departments involved even in what CRM usually does for us. Um, All right. So, talking about exchanging data with external partners. So, a lot of publishers work with subscription agents. And one frequent thing that happens, even though we, as a publisher, may send out a renewal notice to the customer, the subscription agent may also want to be notified. And we, we take care of that. But often that email might get buried, might get lost. And we may be contacted, OK, what's my renewal price for this customer? OK, and I have questions about this customer. I need to log some issue. Maybe I need to do an address change, something like that. And it was actually taking up a lot of our reps' times, actually taking all these calls of just something that we know we've deployed or we just know this is, there's an, there's an easier way to do it. So what we've done is actually we've created a website, a basically an agency, subscription agency portal. And while it take, took a little bit of setup to do this, it actually allowed us to actually set up something where the, cust the actual sales agent will go in and the sales agent will actually go in and actually review their customers. So skip ahead just to this slide. This is just an example of one. So taking just the example accounts from before. So we have our, this is all of our open SSP bakery agency accounts with Bread University Press. So you can see three different accounts. This is all taking Salesforce information, plugging it into a public facing site. This is password protected so that only SS bakery agency can go there. And the good thing is, is that we can have the same site bring in information for different agencies. So depending on their login information, it'll bring in just that specific agency's customers. And you'll see all the expiration dates. This is sorted by expired date. You can sort it however way you want. But we know that when the Dissemination Cafe and Bookstore renews, and they now have a new renewal date of, in 2019, it's now going to go to the bottom of the list because now the, now the agent's probably not caring about something that's coming up for a renewal in a year. We can also show where the, how much the, we've quoted to the customer as well as how much the agency owes us for the customer, their agency remit, as well as the stage in the sales process that we're in. 
You'll also notice two icons on the far right. There's one that looks like a little piece of paper. That's if the agency says, okay, I need some kind of written documentation to send to my finance team, some kind of invoice or statement. That allows them to actually go print out their own PDF just for that specific customer. And then they can take that, it has all official payment information that the agency will need. And that, that actually was, that took up a lot of our sales reps time. We're just getting those requests constantly, even though uh, this is something that they have the quote already in hand, so, but they need something more official. And the last thing, the little envelope, what will happen is say they had a question, you know, dissemination cafe and bookstore. It wasn't really from Denmark, it was from Finland. So the one we wanted to actually tell the excuse me, SSP bakery agency wanted to tell us about a change. So what they did was that they went in and they'll click on that little envelope and it'll ask them, okay, who do you, uh, ask them what they want to send. They'll print in information, okay, change this to Finland. It'll actually set, send out an alert to the sales rep or anybody you want to assign it to, as well as log a case, a service ticket essentially, uh, so that there's a permanent record of, okay, the, the, uh, the sales agent, subscription agent had to have, actually had a question and now this is what we did with this information. So now it's permanently logged and if the subscription agent goes back in later on and, to, and says, okay, did I actually submit that change request? I didn't see Denmark change yet. It will actually keep track of the history and publicize it. So all the information you have in your CRM, you can publicize in some way, shape or form. Now here comes a really fun part, the tips and tricks. All right. So first off, don't assume that the out-of-the-box functionality are the only options. There are many, many ways of actually going in and customizing your CRM. Some of it's really simple in terms of just creating a new text field or something like that. Other stuff can get a lot more complicated. Don't be intimidated too much by it. If you guys can go in and do a, in, in Microsoft Excel, if you can do a basic if function, you can do the vast majority of what you need to do in a custom uh, Salesforce or, or Dynamics formula. You also want to talk about investing in a data connector. So when you're uploading data into your CRM, you really have a few different options. You can manually upload this into Salesforce with a CSV file. Uh, you, if you, some programs actually have an API that will connect automatically, but you have to typically use it the way the API is designed to do, so, which may not work with the way you want it to do. Or you can actually invest in a data connector, say like Dell Boomi or Scribe. And what will happen is that you actually can, uh, for example, any jam, what we do is we have an FTP site that gets, that has our file from our subscription management system. On a nightly basis, it dumps, it, it dumps an FTP, uh, CSV file into this FTP site. Our data connector it takes that CSV file and we've already pre-mapped where each of the, each, each bit of data should go, basically saying, okay, the, it says institution name in our account management, excuse me, our subscription management system, but in uh, the CRM, it may be account name or institution name, whatever it is, it might be a different name, we've mapped it, and therefore on a nightly basis, it's gonna go in, the, uh, the data can go in, snag that file, and upload it. Now when you're talking though about data connectors, my strong rec recommendation is that you create a hub custom object. And all that really is, is basically just a custom object that's gonna be the repository for where your data connector is gonna upload data to. What that'll enable you to do is that when the data's flowing back and forth into your CRM, this gives you a way of basically like a stopping point. So the data will still flow into your CRM, but let's just say you wanted to farm it out to this part of it to your opportunities, this part to your account, this part to this and this and this. It makes it easier if you can get all the data in one place in your CRM first and then farm it out. Especially because if you make any changes to your, to your CRM that maybe now your uh, it's, it, it's maybe now the, the formula you had set up to send from your hub to your opportunity might be broken, but at least the data you know is going into Salesforce. It might be just a quick fix as opposed to, oh my God, the data is completely lost. And as I mentioned before, make your CRM data visible to users without licenses. That site I showed you before with the subscription agent, that may be for a subscription agent, but that could be for internal users as well. We know that, you know, so for example, editorial, they may not want to have their own Salesforce license. They're, they're going to use it maybe once a year, if that. So rather than pay for a full license, find out what information they need and develop a site for them that draws in that Salesforce information. It's comments about, about their the textbook or something like that that they need to know about. It's feedback about certain articles that they need to be aware of. 
or maybe just information about uh, upcoming articles. Also something you want to talk about if you don't have it already is invest in the design of a data governance team. You want to figure out who is responsible for what, what data. So whether it's, so who's responsible for entering in the account information, who's responsible for making sure that account information is correct, who's, who's responsible for changing a stage, making sure invoices are paid, that kind of thing. You want to set up a whole, you may have heard this term before, uh, for RACI or RASCI, RASCI charts, set that up for your organization, at least people that are going to be touching your data. Get a member from each part of your staff uh, that will be touching your data and have them, have them have a voice in what is going to happen with your data. Then also, a lot of you may use consultants for your CRM admin duties or CRM development duties, and that's perfectly fine. But what I would recommend is have at least one person on staff who can do the very basics. I'm not talking about creating all sorts of crazy templates, but simply being able to add a new user, or maybe just, okay, I'm moving my field from here to here. You don't have to go out and pay a consultant to do that. Have someone who can do the very basics so at least you can handle those quick changes. That's the end of our presentation. Just want to open up the floor for the few minutes we have left with any questions that you may have. Sure, I'm going to grab the microphone. Thanks. This was uh, quite interesting. Uh, my question is at what point does scale become? totally attractive to using a CRM because with some smaller publishers uh, they have only a few customers sometimes setting up some of these systems is too expensive or 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 too complex for such a, a group so what point does it really become necessary to consider a CRM I mean I really think it's you know up to the organization um, right now I work at a fairly small company, Ringgold. Um, there's that, we only have seven users in our CRM, uh, but it's totally worth it for us because we're an international team. Um, so we really need to be able to exchange information using a system, and it's also important to our manager, our management structure, and just having you know those the pipeline goals be realistic and so forth. Um, so I think it's one of those things where if you feel like your sales process is being hindered because you don't have the right technology, that would be the you know, the time to consider a CRM. And what I will say is some are really inexpensive. Um, there's definitely a really wide range of CRMs out there. Um, so, and you know, the smaller business you are, the cheaper your price um, and you pay per license, so. Just out of curiosity, so how, do you, how do you track your information now? Uh, we actually use a CRM question. Okay. Uh, so, so, okay, no, I was going to say, I have kind of a, a similar perspective, and I, I think it's almost like a cost benefit. You know, as a company or organization grows, you are going to have to do one of two things. You're either going to have to add more staff or start to invest in your operations. So if you have such a high work volume that you're starting to say to yourself, okay, do I need to hire another person? And you have to look at the cost of hiring another person versus the cost of getting a CRM. And I, I think that is a really good kind of point to think about it. And on top of that, the going forward as you grow, you're going to keep track of that historical information, which I'm sure if you, if you don't have a CRM, you're keeping track of that in Excel, email. You know, I'm sure you guys have sales reps that might say, eh, it's all saved in my email, be fine. And then yeah. they may leave and you're like, oh my God, where's that information? You don't have it. You want some way of tracking that information. So even from a historical perspective, it's really, really useful. Hi. Um, so I'm curious about contact management across systems. So when you have all of this flowing in and out of your CRM and through other and into and out of other systems, you know, we're we're trying to figure out contact consolidation. We've got customer information in the fulfillment system. We've got um, contact information in the email marketing systems. And I understand that this can connect to all of those, but what becomes your system of record? Where is it consolidated? Is it in the CRM? Is it in the fulfillment system? Is it in a whole nother system that you end up buying that is about contact management? 
You know, I have to say, I don't really have a great answer to this because contact management is the one thing that I continue to struggle with as an administrator. Um, and I think the reason is that, yes, CRM can aggregate your contacts, but contact roles are really, I think, the hardest part of managing your contacts. Um, someone really has to be doing that work. and. I feel like that's kind of outside of how the technology supports it because it's really more of a workflow issue that I know that when and how every company I've ever really struggled with. Um, so I mean, CRMs are a great place to do that if you have the time to devote to setting it up. You can certainly aggregate the information using CRMs, um, but unfortunately I don't know that it solves the problem of trying to figure out who to communicate when and how to make sure that the person who's your access contact doesn't suddenly get a sales email tomorrow. So my recommendation in that kind of that case is to actually look into a master data, data management platform. And so CRM is pretty fine for it, but the same thing, we have all these programs, we're going through the same thing, trying to figure out where to put things. It's best to actually have some kind of repository that can swap things out from there and deal with data management, deal with what you can do in these kind of situations. So it's the last option, buy another. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not why you came, Allison. <laughs> Uh, no, it's fun to deal with. Uh, GDPR's been a big thing on everyone's mind right now, and obviously you've got a lot of information in these systems. What are you doing about it? That's a fantastic question. And actually, it's, it's funny that you bring up GDPR, because I was hypothesizing that that's where Allison's question came from, <laughs> is dealing with you know, the consolidation of contacts so you can you know, apply your policies correctly. And it's, you know, honestly, I think it's something that every organization is looking at how to deal with it, and I, I don't think there is a perfect solution yet. Although CRMs are secure, and they have, I know that Dynamics and Salesforce, at least, the ones that we're working in, have certainly given a lot of recommendations about how to deal with G GDPR and to make sure that you are compliant using their technology. Um, so there is that layer of protection, at least. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, yep. I think we're, we're over time. at time. Yep. So, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And feel free to contact us if you want more information or to talk CRMs.